guys are really lucky to have uh, Frank and to, to be part of this NYU ecosystem. I, I think one of the things, um, this is very weird, I feel like, uh, very serious, like uh, about to debate a Tea Party or something. Um, <laughs> one of my afflictions is bad sense of humor, so I apologize for that off the bat. Um, but uh, I, I think the New York ecosystem, unlike anywhere in the country, is actually uh, dramatically on the upswing. Uh, just the amount of tech, investing, and startups that are happening around the Union Square area. Uh, in healthcare, I think the, the, it's starting to percolate quite a bit. Um, all the big funds from Silicon Valley and Boston are spending more and more time. My meeting just before this was with a, a pretty well-known Boston-based venture capitalist who's probably spending a day a week in New York. So you're here at the right time. Uh, and if I can inspire only one of you uh, to uh, not go to Goldman Sachs or uh, not do a traditional uh, you know, a big company, big pharma uh, role and actually try something at a startup, uh, I've, I've succeeded. Um, the other thing you should know is I have a little bit of ADD. Uh, so um, not, I, or at least it's self, uh, uh, self-classified. So uh, both in my work environment, having done three startups uh, and having uh, an investing thing, but also in moving. So I've lived in Southern California and Boston. Uh, now, you know, coming out about 14 years, I've moved every two. And this June, I moved to the Upper West Side uh, of New York because I, it was time to move again. Uh, so I'm actually proud to say I'm now a New York resident, um, despite that I still have a lot of activities in Boston. So I, I'm on the Acela or the uh, flights quite a bit, uh, but I'm super excited to be uh, in New York City. There's no greater city in the world, and it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun, um, except when you're trying to uh, you know, get to the uh, Lower East Side on a busy... Um, Anyway, so uh, let, me, let me just, uh, actually, before I dive into this, while, while you're thinking about my two options as I graduated um, college, um, I'll say that, uh, as, as Frank said, I sort of have two roles. One is I'm currently CEO of a company. That's where I spend 112% of my time uh, running that business. It is a biotech company that I'll tell you a bit about uh, towards the end. Um, and uh, secondly, I work for Founder Collective, which is a seed stage venture fund, $50 million uh, fund, investing in early stage, in seed stage companies, uh, typically lean companies, so it does err a little more on the side of software and web and those types of things. Uh, but we've done some healthcare investing, uh, particularly things, a couple things related to EMR. Um, and, uh, and so to the extent that anyone's interested in following up with me on either of those fronts, uh, you, I think I have my email and... Uh, my Twitter handle, and uh, I also have a blog uh, there. So uh, I'm totally accessible on that. So I graduated college. I went to uh, probably the third or fourth or fifth uh, uh, least competent school in New York uh, State, Cornell, and uh, uh, in the middle of uh, Ithaca, New York. And I, you know, I graduated with two, two options before me. Uh, one was to go to New York City and um, uh, uh, get a job in uh, the M&A group at Solomon Brothers. I worked hard to get this interview. I, I was pretty much just following the rest of my friends who had been interviewing constantly. Uh, at this, in fact, my roommate ended up getting a job at Goldman Sachs and still there. I got an offer for $78,000 per year and a bonus. And I was ta- at, once I got the offer, I went to the fanciest cafeteria I've ever been to in my life. I mean, it, it, it was unbelievable. Um, the other option, uh, I had started to, I always sort of had this idea of kind of going down a different path, uh, whatever that meant. I had, through a letter writing campaign and connecting with alumni, had connected to a small upstart agency called Endeavor. Has anyone ever heard of this uh, agency by chance? Okay, the Endeavor agency, they rep- at the time were about a 20 person company uh, representing television writers, and they would negotiate those, uh, those, uh, those uh, agreements with the studios. And their star client, and pretty much all the revenue was from David E. Kelly, who actually was uh, probably the most prolific writer at the time. So that was kind of cool, except my job was going to be in the mailroom. Uh, so my job was literally uh, to deliver mail, uh, to fix copiers, read scripts, and write coverage, which was basically summarize uh, the scripts for the agent so they could pretend they knew that they read the scripts. Um, and it was $24,500, $24,500 a year, uh, and I needed a car, which I didn't have. So uh, anyone, can anyone guess uh, which job I uh, selected out of college? Any, any, anybody? Uh, I was 21. I was graduating college. Uh, I, I, I mean, it was before that guy at Salmon got in trouble fixing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this, uh, so this is in 1997, so, uh, you know, Salmon, it was still a pretty prestigious place. I went with option B. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I was sort of like Lloyd, if, for those of you who have seen the show Entourage, which is actually based on the Endeavor agency. Uh, Lloyd is the assistant to Ari. 
uh, in, the, in the show, Ari Gold, who's based on Ari Emanuel, who ran the agency. So it's actually, uh, for those of you who've seen the show on HBO, it's actually quite accurate portrayal of all characters, not necessarily me, but uh, of all the people who work there. And this is effectively where I spent a lot of time doing. So um, it was very cool to have graduated college and say I was in Hollywood uh, and to get to kind of rub elbows with some famous people and read scripts. And uh, I read Six Cent, was it Six Cents? What was that, M. Night? But uh, like well before that came out and uh, read some really cool scripts. But uh, it really wasn't for me. And um, I thought it was going to be sort of like this, uh, just living in Southern California. Uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't quite. Uh, it wasn't quite that. It was uh, a lot of late nights, and uh, you know, certainly the twenty-four-five didn't help. Um, so ar around this time, the the internet had started to be kind of in the public conscious. And my roommate, who was a friend from Cornell, uh, was working at Sapien Corporation, which was one of the early web development shops. And he replaced all the pictures in our living room and in our small apartment uh, with whiteboards. And you can imagine, like you know, we're single guys, like bring people over. They'd be like why is your whole house full of whiteboards? Like, what's wrong with you guys? And we were like, we're thinking of starting a company. People were like, that's the weirdest thing we've ever heard. Like, um, but we just got excited about it. Uh, what had happened was they were doing some work at Sapient and uh, two of my roommates uh, and got the idea that um, Amazon was just coming to market and they were selling books on the web. But the thing you couldn't buy on the web was service oriented stuff, right? Whether it was uh, booking an appointment with a doctor, or we focused on kind of more mundane services like plumbers, uh, maids, uh, physical therapists, that type of thing. We said, why can't you go online and book an appointment? And this is back in 1998, by the way. A lot of people are doing this uh, today. Um, and, uh, and so we created uh, a company, which we, we started in our living room uh, in our, in our uh, crappy apartment in Brentwood, California. And um, uh, this is actually a screenshot of our first first uh, first prototype uh, website that we used to get funding. And uh, from Idea Lab, which uh, was one of the first incubators in the country, we raised $4 million. Uh, and of course, it all sounds easy, but we got, we got the company going uh, around this, this general concept. Um, we got a lot of press, actually. Uh, back in that day, you know, the, um, the idea of uh, booking an online appointment for a service was pretty, pretty revolutionary. Uh, and you know, one of my lessons learned was maybe we were a little bit too far ahead of where consumers and service businesses were. But we literally sprinted up or, or grew quickly to 25 employees. Uh, we had had some uh, fairly well-known customers in the space. And uh, it was sort of an MBA uh, accelerated faster than one could possibly get an MBA. I was president and COO at 22 or 23 years old with 25 employees. Uh, we subsequently raised $25 million from SBC Communications and our existing investors. They were the largest phone company. They wanted to resell this uh, technology to all their Yellow Page customers. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we acquired a company. And I had done that all in the span of two or three years. We had a $100 million valuation, um, which was sort of amazing. And one of the lessons I learned there, uh, the second bullet point, uh, is there's a big difference between real value and paper value. Um, that's another thing, if you take nothing else away. Um, you can't actually spend valuation. Uh, I tried. Um, it, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, so had I known what I know now, I might have said, you know what, just buy us for 30 and call it a day. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, it, uh, you know, I saw the rise and fall, like many did, of the dot-com days and how you know, our company on paper was worth a lot. Uh, but then when the market crashed, it really wasn't worth a whole, uh, heck of a lot, certainly not near there. Um, you know, we, we thought we understood the market, um, but, but we didn't really understand um, the, 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 the lead gen business we were, we were building. In fact, as we started this business, we started emailing the job leads to carpet cleaners and house cleaners saying, hey, you've got a customer who's interested in booking an appointment. Uh, and we get no response, and we get no response. So about six months go by, and we realize these guys don't check their email, or we don't have the right email. So we started faxing them. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy today, but literally that's what we did. We would fax them job offers. That's how uh, biz, small businesses at that time, and even to some extent today, but certainly at that time, would get. Uh, and I don't think we totally appreciated that going into it. Um, the third bullet point, these are some of my lessons uh, over three years at Handshake. Um, 
don't just recruit your fraternity brothers. So unfortunately, of the first 10 companies, and they're all good friends, they remain good friends, um, my only network was other 23-year-olds who had gone to Cornell who were sort of like me and had similar skill sets, maybe same major. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things, maybe Fred's can talk a little bit about, diversity is critical. Diversity of skill sets, diversity of experience, diversity of age, diversity, you know, we, um, the strength of our network, you know, things are so interdisciplinary. Comp and, and because uh, you're, a, you're a, uh, a small company, you need a lot of really flexible athletes. And, and the challenge was we had a lot of inexperienced young guys pretty much out of Cornell. And while it was a lot of fun, uh, it was the wrong set of people to build a company around. Uh, and it took us some time to kind of unwind that and build the right team. Uh, focus on one market, not 10. We were sort of in every vertical. And we thought that um, you know, in order to be what we wanted Handshake to become, which is sort of the Amazon of services, we had to knock off everything you could imagine in services. The problem was uh, every one of these verticals was actually quite different. The way the industry operated, who the big players were, how they wanted to schedule and service. And so um, we sort of became uh, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none when it came to that. The, I, I, the next one talks about COCA. Uh, does anyone know what COCA stands for, by the way, besides the COLA? It stands for the cost of customer acquisition. And the point there is um, often businesses forget that the map, you know, and a lot of startups fall into this trap. Uh, and, and I think I've made the mistake more than once. The math has got to work. The cost of customer acquisition has to be less than the value of a customer, right? It's sort of the 101. But the problem we had was in order to fulfill a consumer request, for a particular job, we would have to get, we, we might have to spend, let's say, $20, sorry, in order to advertise enough to get consumers onto our site, we might have to spend $50, let's say. And the value of the job lead to us was, let's say, $10. So in the end, we would lose 40, I'm, I don't remember the exact numbers, every time we scored a, a customer, every time a customer matched to a, uh, to a service provider. So, you know, for those of you that remember, there was an old Saturday Night Live uh, uh, bit about uh, the first change bank. And, and somebody goes into the, in the commercials like, here at First Change Bank, how do you make money? Uh, you know, oh, they say, you know, what we do is we make change. You come in with a dollar. Someone's like, it was late at night. I came in with $10, and they made change. And, you know, and, and, and they say to us, how do we make money? Volume, volume, right? Um, well, that was sort of our approach, right? We were losing 40 bucks a customer, but we were going to make it up on volume. So I say that tongue in cheek because that math will never work. But it's something that a lot of companies don't spend the time really thinking about. Can you get that math to work? It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to work overnight. But you have to show a path by which your costs are going to uh, your cost of customer acquisition can be less than the revenue lifetime value of a customer. And you have to focus on building a business, not having a company, especially for first time entrepreneurs. It's very exciting to get office space. It's very exciting to get your first patent. It's very exciting to um, write a business plan to enter a business plan competition. But those are not company, uh, sorry, those are not business building activities. Those are company activities, or depending on how you want to think about the lingo. My point is, you, it's easy to get caught up in the, the fun of setting up an entity. But that's not actually, you know, um, uh, I often skip any, you know, uh, in, in my company today, Novaphage, there's always issues like, uh, you know, geez, what color should we paint the walls, or what should we name the conference room? And I'm like, I don't care. You guys decide. Um, and it's not. It's not that I truly don't care. I actually have opinions on a lot of this stuff. It's just that, um, and if they were here, they'd say that's not true because I do weigh in. But then I say you decide. Um, it's because really, in the end, it's about building a company. Can I find a market and can I execute a product around that market? And you know, uh, it, it, and I think it's where first. You know, uh, often, you know, if you think about Hewlett Packard starting in a crappy garage in Palo Alto, California, they didn't think about what space they were in. They thought about the products they were building. And, and so I, I think that's a good sort of uh, mantra. So anyway, moving to my second business. So uh, fast forward a little bit. Um, by the way, anyone can chime in with questions or kind of. It's, yeah, good. Yeah. Um, by the way, if you don't want me to do questions because of the video, I can. Uh, so the question, I'll repeat the question. The question is, how do you do COCA, or how do you think about that in the biotech context? It is hard, uh, and it's not as straightforward. I do think you have to believe, um, you know, for example, in our case, we're building a biologic. And we've at least created models where we believe the cost of creating the biologic as it comes down uh, relative to what we think we can get for it 
uh, will make sense. Now, I'll admit it's very high level. A lot of assumptions are baked into this. Um, but, I, you know, so it is a hard thing to apply early. But as you get further and further along, you should be gain confidence that you can make that. It does happen in, in biotech quite a bit where um, one of the issues we have is chemistry versus biology, right? Chemistry being cheap, commoditized, uh, biology being new, cutting edge, hard. Uh, we often ask ourselves, are we going to be able to win that battle? Or in the end, are, are, are the customers going to be like, what you do is great. It's green. It's new. It's biotech. But these chemicals work just fine and they're, you know, 25% of the cost. So I, I do think you at least have to start building those, those constructs early. Um, I think also you have to map the technology to the size of the opportunity, which is a little bit of a sidebar for a second. But the point is, if you're using biotech, which is early in the evolution of it as a technology field, and is an inherently riskier field than, let's say, a software or web startup, you have to go after markets where if you do, so and problems where if you do solve it, the rewards are really there. Uh, one of the, you know, if, um, in software, you can go after a par three and nail it, and then go after a par four and go after. And par in in biotech, it's a little bit harder to play that game, because inherently everything's a par five, or a par ten, to use a bad analogy. So, um, so I'm so I learned a lot in this web software world. Uh, saw the value of my shares go from millions of dollars to millions uh, to a couple of pennies. Um, so uh, uh, one of our, uh, our head of product management was a Harvard Business School grad. I started chatting with him, and we, we had taken the company from 50 people down to about 12, and I decided I wanted to sort of do something different. Um, I got into Harvard Business School. It's 6 o'clock. Apparently it's 6 o'clock. Um, I got into Harvard Business School and um, sort of started I I uh, meeting a bunch of folks uh, that were entrepreneurial. Eric Paley, who's a uh, partner of mine at Founder Collective, a bunch of other folks, uh, a professor at MIT. Um, just started getting into the Boston tech ecosystem. I knew I wanted to start another company. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. And uh, during the course of my two years at business school, wrote a business plan called Bronte's Technologies based on some real-time 3D imaging that it came out of the mechanical engineering lab at MIT. Uh, I'll tell you that business plan, we came in second place. We won 10 grand. I tried depositing that in the ATM, by the way. It didn't, didn't work well, but um, maybe with the ones now where you can take a picture. But nonetheless, um, uh, I thought the, uh, uh, you know, I thought we had it nailed, you know, we had won this, we come second in this business plan competition. It was not the business we ended up starting. So we actually, so it's an interesting lesson that here we, you know, we, we beat out hundreds of applicants in the business plan competition, and yet it wasn't even the right business plan that we ended up ultimately starting. Um, so I'll tell you a little more about this business because I think it's interesting and it, it will be, as you'll see where we, where we sort of pivot to is a medical device. Um, the original vision from the folks in the lab, and it was a very crude technology, was basically that they had uh, a real-time 3D imaging system that they thought was going to be as easy as a point-and-shoot system. It was a single camera, 30 frames per or 22 frames per second, 3D imaging system. You could put your hand in front of it, it barely worked. You could put your hand in front of it and you could see on the screen your hand in 3D. And so when we first met this team, the professor and the postdoc said, we're just, we're going to build uh, 3D cameras for, for, for everybody. And we were like, everybody whom? And they were like, just everybody, right? Everybody's going to want a 3D camera. We live in a 3D world. Who wouldn't want a 3D camera? And I think what we realized over time was sort of MBA 101, right? Which has got to pick a focus. And I'd sort of learned this in my first business. But the idea of, not, not to mention there were a lot of technological product questions like, how are people going to watch your, the stuff you capture in 3D? Um, but not even withstanding those things, just the idea of, being this sort of generic 3D imaging system was so high level and so grandiose and so kind of um, unfocused, it would never become sort of a real business. So um, what we sort of kind of kept working at, and this is what the business plan competition thing was about, we started saying, okay, what can we do? Well, we'll take this module, and we called it the hockey puck, because uh, it sort of looked like a hockey puck, and the professor at MIT was a bit of a hockey nut, and we will take um, cameras, specifically endoscopes and microscopes, and allow them to capture depth will allow them to capture 3D. Um, and you can imagine, uh, we still were at a pretty high level of abstraction, um, but we thought, uh, we, we thought this might be a pretty interesting uh, product offering. And so we, we, we sort of um, approached this in, in stages. You know, we, um, hang on one second, make this larger so I can see it. Um, we, we started by building relationships uh, with the technical team. That was sort of our first our first goal was just to better understand the technology. One of the things I'd say for those of you, how many of you would like to start a company in the next couple of years uh, in the kind of, in a technology or medical sense? I assume all those with the hands up. 
I think if you're a business person or a technical person, you have to learn the other language. So um, I think there's this temptation to sort of say like, oh, the technical guys worry about the techie stuff and the business. That, that's not the way startups work. Um, we had to really build relationships and understand technology. When, when, when I say uh, the system worked at 22 frames per second, if you had asked me in 1999 what, what frames per second meant or what FFT processing was or what um, you know, a polarized lens was, I thought you'd be speaking Greek. But I, I really made the effort, um, and it's not impossible to do, even with a liberal arts background like myself, to learn the technological uh, basics of, of what you're going to do. And likewise, the technical team learned a lot about the business side of what we were trying to do. Uh, then we did a brain, and I'm going to talk about this in a second. We brainstormed every potential market application for this technology. What, what could 3D do in anything so that we could start winnowing down to the right market application? Um, and then we narrowed our focus for market research, so really kind of hone in on a couple of them that we would go deep and really understand. Um, when I talk about market research, and one of the things I'd encourage, you know, Google is great, the web is great, you can learn a ton from reading, Wikipedia is unbelievable, except that there's nothing that replaces actually talking to people, primary research. So if I want to start a company in, somebody pick a few, somebody throw out an, uh, an, an area that they're working on, or just a general, general field that they're looking at potentially innovating in. Robotic applications and pharmaceuticals. Robotics and pharmaceuticals. If you don't talk to someone at Pfizer, you don't talk to someone at Lilly, you don't talk to someone at wherever, um, or at some of the companies that service those companies, you'll never actually get a sense of what the opportunity is. I remember reading these research reports and making these charts and saying, it's a $10 billion industry. And then I talked to people who were selling into this industry and they're like, uh, it's the worst industry in the world. It's, there's no way it's $10 billion. The way these research reports are, they're adding this, that, 90% of its service, 10% of its product. So unless you're going to be a service business, you're not going to capture any of the value. So my point is not to, not to like, not spend any time using market research or, or going on Google or Wikipedia or, or digging up articles, but primary research is the single most important thing a, an entrepreneur can do in a startup. My job as CEO, pretty much all day long, I have two to three jobs. One is recruit, recruit the best team I can. The second is talk to people in industry and to some extent academia, but largely in industry, to better hone our market strategy. That's basically what I do. I, I talk to people in industry and I ask a lot of questions. Um, what we did in this case was we entered the business plan competitions because we were in school and we thought those would be useful tools. And I encourage, uh, I think I've judged one, one round of the NYU competition in the past. They are good ways to kind of get your ideas vetted, get in front of venture guys. They don't guarantee money. They don't uh, make the business plan for you. They're good exercises along the way. Um, and then we took out a, a technology license from the TLO. I forget what they call it at NYU, the Office Technology Transfer or something like that. NYU what? Office of Industrial Liaison. The, yeah, what he said. Um, so uh, we came up, we, we sat around whiteboards. We said, OK, we got a real-time 3D imaging technology at MIT, some of these rock star brilliant guys. By the way, please. Uh, uh, please don't look at uh, application number 22. That shouldn't be on the list. But uh, we, we, we said, what are all the possible applications of 3D imaging technology? And I think if we as a group sat here on these, on these chalkboards, we could probably come up with 100 more. And this was the beauty and the curse. And this happens a lot, especially with innovative technologies. It's, it's almost like you could do anything, right? Platform technologies are inherently exciting and scary because you can almost do anything. So we, 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 we said if we had a 3D tool that could image in real time, was relatively low cost, we could do any of these things. I guess cloning also was maybe a bit of a stretch. But, um, and so uh, we, uh, we, we decided to kind of focus. So, so having won the business plan competition, having identified all these markets, uh, we decided to kind of go out with that business plan that we would be sort of a component for these industries to enable them to create 3D cameras for their applications. So here was the problem. One, the venture market was crappy. Uh, in 2000, you could get, you know, if you had a pulse and, you know, people like me were raising money for crazy ideas. Uh, 2003, when we graduated business school, was among the worst years of the last six for venture capital raising. And though $18 billion sounds like a lot, most of that's follow-on capital, most of that's not going to new companies. So uh, it was a pretty tough place to be. But as you guys, as I've alluded to, um, and as I, uh, as, 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 you know, I, I want to get across, the problem wasn't really that it was a bad venture market. Sorry if this is a little hard to read. 
Uh, and this is an actual slide from the 50K update. So it actually turned out that $10,000 check wasn't really 10 grand. It was a little bit of a, um, uh, it was $5,000 up front, $5,000 if you were still around uh, like six months later. So we had to go back in uh, and say we're still around. Um, but we said here's, so this is an actual slide. I took the, the actual slide from 19, uh, sorry, from September 18th, 03. We said, we got a problem. You know, our business plan was really a bunch of markets strung together. Um, everything was going to be application specific. We were really going to become a consulting and integration shop, not a product company. Uh, we were depending on all these other OEMs and all those different markets. And so what we were going to do was change our strategy. We were going to find one market where we could go direct, where the solution was highly repeatable, uh, where we solved the large pain, and we really leveraged the assets of the technology. So instead of being a platform company, which I've now learned is kind of an excuse for saying you haven't found the market you're going after, um, we're going to solve a specific problem. Well, uh, anyone want to guess? You guys probably read my bio, so you, you may know it. But anyone want to guess what, what market we went after? Dental. Dental. And if you, look, if you remember back to the slide I showed a couple ago, it was number 10 on that list. Now, it wasn't a ranked order, but it shows you how low it was in our thinking. I don't think we talked more about teeth or dentistry in the first two years, or the first year and a half while we were at HBS, more than 10 minutes. But it turned out, after some luck, some bumping into people that randomly had known a bit about this, the fact that my business partner gagged every time he had a dental impression, uh, was about to go to the dentist and was fearing it like the plague, um, it turned out that the dental impression was highly repeated, 50 million of them done a year, 200 million in the, in the, in the world. Um, it was expensive, time-consuming, uncomfortable. Does anyone here like a dental impression? Maybe there's always like one person who's like, yeah. Um, and totally antiquated. In fact, there's, there's evidence the Egyptians were sticking paste in, in people's mouths and making gold castings. Um, totally antiquated. And so we decided, uh, now mind you, we had pitched venture capitalists, we had come in second in the MIT business plan competition, and we decided we were going to throw out that business plan. In fact, we were about to go into a partner meeting at a, venture, a noted venture capital firm that many of you would have heard of, and we actually pulled the plug on that meeting because we said, we just don't believe in the plan anymore, and we're shifting markets and we need some time to retrench. And so we came up with this idea for impression-free dentistry, that we would do it, and I liked the tagline, no more goop. Um, so we were going to use our 3D technology, focus on building a product that would be held, handheld, would scan the teeth. Did we have any idea we could accomplish this? Not really, but we knew we had kind of an interesting reason for being. And that's what startups are, right? They're just a, re they're, they're a seed that gets planted. It's a reason for being. We had some expertise in 3D imaging, and we were going to plow ahead in the dental market. Now, uh, given that the, the venture market was still pretty crappy, uh, we got a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not welcoming emails uh, for, or uh, people not really excited about investing in that market. So here we were, some relatively young, although we had both done some startup stuff. Neither of us had really had a big success under our belt. But um, entrepreneurs trying to get funded an, uh, a business in the dental market, which uh, is not one that venture capitalists typically think of. Uh, when they think of venture investing. Um, so what did we do to get around that? How did we finally get funded? Well, you know, we, we, we talked to the market and we expanded our network. So Kelsey Worth, and this is where randomness and luck and timing really play a role. Kelsey Worth, who had founded Invisalign, young Stanford MBA. Everybody know Invisalign, clear braces. Grew it from zero to probably now $400 million company. That's over 10 years. But in three to five years out from business school, she grew that company with her partner to about, let's say, 100 150 million. Took it public. When we were raising money, it was worth 800 million market cap. It was clear braces. I mean, think about how, you know, and, and as we became a very cosmetic oriented. Uh, so Kelsey was a great example of someone we could put on the board and say to investors and others, see, it can be done in dental. Uh, you know, we're not crazy. Um, and she was a huge help. We got the dean of Harvard Dental School who came in and really took an active interest in what we were doing. We found the guy in industry because we were out talking to the industry. Mike Gerard was kind of the elder statesman of the dental industry and everybody, you know, they were like, wow, Mike's involved with your company. Uh, gave us a lot of credibility. We found an investor, probably one of like four people on the planet that focus on dental um, and got him excited about what we were doing. Uh, a guy by the name of Gerard Mouflet. Uh, Ping Fu, who happened to have an, uh, an interest in 3D modeling and reconstruction, because she had a venture-backed startup called Geomagic, which, which took 3D data and reconstructed and surfaced it. So if we were successful, it was good for her company. And we made these um, guys various uh, 
We hired Mike full time so he could go into that room, whether we were talking to potential biz dev or financers. Uh, we got investors from, from some of the, the others and advisors. So um, sort of the, the takeaway here is in addition to kind of going direct and, and getting good research, it helped us build our team uh, to something that all of a sudden legitimized us in the eyes of investors and, and others. Um, so now I'm going to just walk you quickly through, uh, and I'll try to wrap up in the next 15 minutes to open up for questions. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we built uh, the first version of our product, the Alpha device. Um, and uh, like all technical startups, it's not without its own hitches. So uh, this was, uh, I, I won't swear, but was affectionately known around the company as the effing bazooka um, because uh, it was rather large. And uh, in fact, we were so worried about the risk of actually using it on, uh, one of the nice things about the dental market is uh, it's relatively easy to test. You know, you don't have to do like rats or, you know, uh, go way overseas into some country where no one knows what you're doing. You, you, you can actually just put someone in the chair and start scanning them. But we were worried about liability. Uh, so I was the person we put in the chair. Yeah, I'll take the question. Go ahead. Uh, the people, the team, sure. Um, a lot of it was a courting process. So, um, you know, my, my partner at Founder Collective, Chris Dixon, likes to say, if you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. And I think that's really true. Um, and so, you know, we would go around um, and say, you know, hey, Kelsey, we know you built this great business, and, and, and we, we, we're not ready for money. Um, we just need some advice. And, you know, we just want to talk to you about your experience in the dental market. You know, we'd go for coffee. We'd get her more excited about what we're doing. And, you know, one day she was like, hey, would you mind if I put some money in? We were like, you know, um, but, but that's sort of how it evolved. The same thing with Mike Gerard. It was probably a two-year, year-and-a-half courting process. We'd, see it, we'd go to some of the trade shows. We'd try to get coffee with him, you know, try to, try, you know, and, 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 you know, say, Mike, it'd be great if you could join our advisory board someday. And then, you know, and all of a sudden, he became VP Mark. You know, it's just one day, you know, it sort of became apparent that he was the right guy, and, we, you know, we, could, we raised money at that point. So um, it, it was very much a, a courting process, if that makes sense. Um, so getting back to our alpha device, um, you know, here I am, a uh, liberal arts major, scared, you know, the Jesus out of me that we're not making progress technologically because we got this thing that uh, is too, you know, large. So I was the patient always. Um, that is a very expensive dental chair, uh, which can be purchased at Target for about $15 uh, <laughs> below. Um, the other problem we were having, the tip was overheating because we need so much light in the mouth. The LEDs were so bright, uh, it was constantly tripping the circuit because it was so hot. And then in order to cool it, um, we took a, uh, uh, an igloo cooler, a styrofoam cooler. We filled it with cold water, had a fish tank pump uh, pumping cold water through the, uh, the camera. There were three cameras in the back and the LEDs up front. The problem was the tubing kept leaking. So whenever I'd be scanned, I'd also get soaking wet. Um, this is both the fun and the challenge of early stage technological development. But you know, the cool thing was we were starting to see it take shape, right? This little concept of an idea was starting to take form. Um, after one year of development, we were getting the thing to work a little bit, except there was one caveat. We realized we needed a contrast medium on the teeth. The teeth, the surfaces were too white. There wasn't enough contrast. And the only way we could get it to work is if you really propped your lips open and you sprayed this or a painted silver black coating kind of nail polish stuff on the teeth. Uh, at which point Mike Gerard said, I think I need to catch them. He, he was from Detroit. He moved to Boston to, to work with us. I think I need to catch the next flight to Detroit because we are never going to sell this thing. Um, in fact, the impression is a lot better than this. Um, in fact, at this point, this, I shouldn't say this, this was our intern uh, that we were using as a uh, uh, test. And um, uh, I remember at one point, you know, he came into, uh, we, we didn't have offices, we just had an open bullpen. He said, you know, Mike, I can't get it off. Um, and I was like, scrape harder, buddy. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a step along the way. Uh, you know, uh, startups are very fragile and, and kind of a roller coaster. They're up and down. Um, and some of our first scans also, Starting to look better, but uh, you know they they uh, they still were a bit noisy. If, if anyone's looked at 3D surface data, you can see there's a lot of outlier points um, and uh, and pretty uh, pr pretty um, pretty messy. But but uh, but getting there. Um, and so fast forwarding, of course, I'm going quickly. Um, we ended up changing that black and silver stuff. We did need a contrast medium, but we we ended up moving to a titanium dioxide. Um, white powder that was easily sprayed. We built our own battery-operated sprayer. It took a little while, but uh, same stuff that was in toothpaste and deodorant and that sort of thing. You would just lightly dust the teeth. 
um, and we built our first beta scanners and got built about 10 of them out in the uh, out in the real world and then we did our first patient case so we actually scanned it was probably among the first truly digital dental cases ever done uh, really in the world we scanned teeth uh, there was, I forget the patient's name. I can't tell you for HIPAA reasons anyway. But um, we scanned the patient uh, at, a, at a doctor's office. We did, it, uh, we did both a control study with the traditional impression, and then that's on a, a stereolithography model, a 3D printed model based on our data um, of, a, of a bridge uh, made based on digital data. So again, we sort of saw it, saw it all come together. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, sort of the timeline, you know, just to give you a sense of how it started, you know, started with this kind of core technology, uh, then focused on dentistry. Uh, in 2004, we ended up taking 500K from a, f a private investor. Uh, in January, in June, we raised uh, 8 million in two tranches. And I can talk about what that means uh, at the end of, uh, if there's any questions. So it was 8 million divided up into to two, two chunks. Um, the initial team was myself, another colleague from HBS, and the professor who was not full-time one day a week. Uh, MIT research scientist and, and a research scientist. I'll talk about the exit in a second. Um, and today, uh, there's about a team of 50 uh, uh, in Minneapolis. Well, this sort of get that's pretty easy to guess what happened. But in St. Paul, Minnesota, with about thousands of units sold. I don't know what the number is now. Uh, when I made these slides, these, these slides were a little dated. About 40 million in sales. Um, we sold the company in 2006 to 3M Corporation, um, really because this was, you know, we had really. Um, shown that we could disrupt a potential huge cash cow for them, which was the traditional dental impression material. Big companies, opportunities for exits happen for two reasons. One, because they fear that their existing business is under threat. This is, and actually, this is a really important point that I don't think all entrepreneurs really get. Big, big companies are motivated, like human beings to some extent, by both greed and fear. But, and if you can couple them both, you maximize your exit. So if they see a big opportunity in a new space, it's going to get them excited. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll finish the point and answer your question. Unfortunately, greed is only so powerful because a lot of big companies are kind of arrogant, sort of of the belief, yeah, you know, it'll take a long time for dentists to die. But if they believe that there's new technology, and look, everybody's seen how iPhone disrupted the cell phone market, how Nokia, and now to some extent, no offense to anyone carrying a BlackBerry, but are probably about to be, you know, or what's happened at Yahoo. So, so, so companies are keenly aware that they can be disrupted. Um, so, so if they're scared that their franchise can be disrupted and that there's this new revenue opportunity called a new product. By the way, we were selling our product for $30,000 for the equipment. They were selling Goop for $20 a use. Um, you know, that became a very powerful combination for the exit. Now I'll take your question. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the nice things about the dental market, one of the things actually, uh, I think your regulatory strategy and IRB, so we didn't have an IRB, we did a study uh, um, with Tufts, I wanna say. Um, I may, we may have started at Harvard, but Tufts was a larger program in the Boston area. Um, we did an IRB study where we did this control A versus B, but I will, I will readily admit that the dental market was a little more loosey-goosey in that we could go into the dental and, you know, uh, you know, you could go into a dentist practice, you could sort of say, and still be totally within the, uh, with, 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 you know, within the, the rules and regs, you could, um, you could sort of gather data without a whole lot of bureaucracy over that, uh, especially because they're in private practice and they have the right to say, I, I'm going to try this. We would have patients sign waivers. We would, you know, abide by all that, and we did do an IRB. Um, but I would say compared to trying, you know, an oncology drug, uh, the bar was just much lower. It was much easier to try. And the second part was FDA. There was, we did a 510K, but there was a special exemption, and I, this is a huge thing in biotech uh, and in medical, I get smart on the regulatory strategy early because you will find, first of all, I think regulatory strategy does drive a little bit of how you think about building a business in healthcare. And I think you will find exemptions and, or not necessarily exemptions, but smoother paths in areas where you would least expect it. Um, and so you should get smart on that stuff early. Did you have a follow-up point or? Okay. Um, so anyway, I, this is what the product looks like today. Uh, it's sold by 3M Corporation. They moved the business, sadly, a year ago to, to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So a lot of the employees now of the company are not the original people. But what's neat about that company and why I'm so passionate about startups is it's great that this company got started. But what's even more interesting and cool to me and satisfying is uh, one or two couples, actually between both companies, have gotten married. 
uh, having met at, at both Handshake and, and Brontes, uh, five companies have been started based on alumni from those companies. So that's the kind of ongoing ecosystem that gets that makes me excited about uh, being a, uh, an entrepreneur. Um, so uh, a, a couple of thoughts uh, as I wrap here, uh, and, and I'll talk about Novaphage in a minute because that, that may be the most interesting. But a couple, a couple of thoughts since I was a student at MIT, and many of you, how many of you are students now or postdocs or PhDs? Or, so many of you are. Take advantage of the fact that, you, that, you're, um, uh, that you're a student. You know, as soon as you call somebody like an executive at a company and you're like, hey, I'm working at this startup that might compete with you, uh, and I'd like to, you know, pick your brain for information for the next hour, they're a little less receptive. When you're a student at NYU doing a research project on 3D imaging, or my, you know, I'm calling on behalf of, everyone would answer that call. Oh yeah, you know, I remember when I was two, you know, like you can use alumni. It's just a lot easier. Um, doors will open, and, I, and and being able to talk about you know research relation, a uh, research project. Um, I think this to the comment about asking for advice early. Uh, people like to help. People like to talk. People like to be. Uh, success has many fathers, uh, you know, failure is an orphan. Um, people root for the underdog. It's good to kind of early on get people involved and get people who, you know, are advising you, helping you out uh, a, a, as much as possible. And level, leverage the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You're in New York City, which has funders. It has, you know, seasoned executives. If, if I was starting a, a biotech company, um, I, uh, I can't imagine a better city. Well, let me, let me rope in North Jersey. But I can't imagine a better area to find seasoned executives in the, in, in, at least from Big Pharma, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and, and that's just one piece of it. If, if you're looking for funding, this is a great market. You know, if you're looking for uh, biotech talent, you know, probably outside of Silicon Valley and, and Boston, it, it's, it's all over the place. So um, leverage the, 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 the thing. Um, why I like technology-oriented startups. So you're going to, you're gonna, you know, there's a reason this room is not filled with 150 people, and I'm sure maybe Fred Wilson's will be. And that's because, um, not just because uh, he's better looking, although that's probably true, uh, it's that, the, you know, technology-oriented startups are a little less in vogue right now than um, more web, consumer-oriented stuff. But you know what? We're real innovation. If you just look at the, the companies that have shaken up industries, particularly technology, they've been core technological innovation. Or in healthcare, the, you know, Genentech, you know, was genetic engineering technology, right? That's what Genentech's name is. In 1976, got started. So um, it's it's usually, in my humble opinion, disruptive, hardcore science and technology. That uh, it's not it's not the next uh, website that allows you to do. Some, I've no, you know, Google arguably is 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 quite technical in nature. Um, but I, I think it's easy to get lost in the hype about. Um, Foursquares and Twitters, which have had huge implications on us sociologically um, and in terms of startups. But I, I do think, uh, as an entrepreneur, what excites me is bringing real science and real technology to bear. Why? Because you can stronger barriers to entry. It's much easier to replicate um, Groupon than it is to replicate Genentech. Just is. And therefore, if you can get that kind of innovation, it's not easy. Um, but the you know the, the strength of the patents, the strength of what you guys can, what one can build, you build real products, right? Um, solve meaningful products, uh, meaningful problems. Uh, I just think often the energy problems facing us, the healthcare problems facing us. Um, I, I don't mean to keep using Groupon as an example because I, I buy a, a bunch of those things, but um, they're not solving major social problems. Um, there, you know, I think if you want to wake up every morning, and part of it is being passionate about what you're doing, there's something about, you know, even though we were in the dental business, we said, um, you know, we are changing the way dentistry is practiced. We know patients don't like what we're doing, don't like, uh, don't like the impression process. It's inaccurate. It's resulting in misfitting crowns, and, in, in, and we're going to change patients' lives. And we had quotes on the wall of patients who were like, thank God your product exists. Um, and it's a great catalyst for being. I, I just think, um, and you can hook up with leaders in your field. You know, the neat thing about core technology is you can get people excited about what you're doing. You know, the foremost doctor or, or the foremost thought leader. Um, I think I talked about this. So, uh, building the venture back company, go to the source, be objective. Uh, I won't. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, you know, I, I think you can read for yourself kind of some of my my, my advice, and I think it's come across. Um, 
uh, I, I, I'm remiss, and I, and I should have, uh, but I ran out of time earlier today, uh, putting in some slides about Novophage. Let me just speak for a minute about what I'm doing today. Novophage was a company, much like Bronte said, uh, when I, after we sold, I stayed at 3M for four years, through March of 2010, running the business for 3M. And I left, and I said, you know, the last thing I'm going to do again is a hardcore science company. <laughs> you know, I need a break from this, spin out of uh, a university, uh, and all that. And of course, I just did just that. Um, but I met a team at MIT, sorry, I met a team at B, that was spun out of BU that had won a business plan, a bunch of business plan competitions that had a, new, a neat antimicrobial technology. Uh, the gist of it was uh, using genetic engineering of bacteriophages and um, had a whole bunch of applications. Where have you seen this movie before, right? And they approached me and they said, you, you've done this. Like, you've taken a core technology and figured out what application. And so uh, I spent about a year as advisor, sort of like the guys on the chart from earlier, as advisor, then board member, and then ultimately a CEO, basically analyzing how we could use this antimicrobial technology. We started out focusing on therapeutics. We now focus on industrial applications, and we're, we're still early in our evolution. We're, we're uh, very focused on the energy sector and, del and using uh, – our antimicrobial technology to uh, r reduce the growth of, of sort of biofilms, which are an insulator, which create a lot of energy problems. But excuse me, but specifically in the oil and gas industry, uh, we believe there's a lot of opportunity for biotech to actually help in the production, the exploration and production of energy. So I won't get into bore you with all the details of of what we're doing, but it's an interesting intersection of the energy market and biotech. And one of the things that excites me is I don't think biotech and energy, have, with the exception of biofuels, have really intersected before. And so one of the things I like to do as, as an entrepreneur is kind of bring technologies that haven't intersected before um, to new markets. And so that's what's kind of excited. So we're in the early days, and we're, uh, we, we, we recently received an investment from Chevron Corporation and some venture capital firms, uh, including Founder Collective. Um, but we, too, are honing in on exactly the application, exactly the pain that we're going to we're going to solve with our with our technology, but that's what I'm up to now. It's a six-person company, so it's way back to square one uh, in the um, uh, in the in the um, uh, in the evolution of the company. Um, and then my night job, uh, my night job is founder partner at Founder Collective. I, uh, um, uh, you're running out of power, which is probably meaning I should I should stop talking here soon. But uh, or this thing's going to crash in a second, um, die in a second. But this is what we do at Founder Collective. We're about eight uh, entrepreneurs who are operating companies every day, two managing directors who are full-time uh, investors. And it's a unique model. Uh, it's a small fund compared to other venture capital funds. And basically, we look for interesting technologies and, and exciting teams. I mean, we've backed people who have dropped out of college you know, all the way on up. So I mean, really not uh, biased anyway, but just exciting young companies, early stage companies, uh, but invested by the peer group. So unlike classic venture capital firms that are in an ivory tower uh, or that are, you know, kind of focused uh, on just investing, we're entrepreneurs investing in other entrepreneurs. So having given you the pitch, I will stop there and take any questions. And hope that was interesting. <laughs>